Tonight, new details in the search for answers in the downing of Flight 752. As loved ones demand justice, Canadian universities stop in tribute. And from Iran, a portrait of sadness to take your breath away. BC battles an unusual snowfall, treacherous conditions, but fresh opportunities. The only loser is Meghan. The Duchess and the tabloid. A legal case spells out a royal grievance. And the medical device giving hope to a Humboldt Bronco. I feel like I can move a little more. What it does, who else has used it, why it's not approved. This is The National. A rare snowstorm on BC's south coast has brought the region to a standstill. But for those who spent the day digging out, keep those shovels at the ready. Weather warnings are still in place tonight. This may have been the easiest way to get around today. The powder is fantastic for a little bit of a ski. But lightheartedness aside, it is serious business out there. Many places have seen 20 centimeters of snow. Ferries have been cancelled due to high winds. Flights have been delayed. Schools closed. Roads, a total mess. And there's more bad weather on the way. Tanya Fletcher takes us up close. It's been 24 hours of paralyzing panic. This is nuts. The problem is you've got a layer of ice underneath the snow. The snow came down all through the night. Drivers stranded in the dark. The Trans-Canada hit with whiteout conditions, shutting down parts of the highway entirely. Pedestrians making a futile attempt to fight back with umbrellas, even the buses apologizing. <laughs> By dawn, the snowfall had transformed the city. That's a steep one. A delight for some. It's fluffy and cold enough, but not too cold. <laughs> For students, a snow day. Classes cancelled at all public schools in the Lower Mainland. I love it. So much. These kids turning a closed side street into a sledding hill. Commuters were hit the hardest, and the province sending out a travel warning urging people to stay home. Here, vehicle after vehicle struggled to make it through the intersection. This driver stuck for three hours and counting. This looks like a pretty new car. These aren't snow tires, are they? No, they're not. I have an appointment tomorrow, which is not helping me today. And that's the problem. The region is not well equipped to deal with this degree of winter weather. It really just hit all, it hit everything, right? It hit all these main routes. The city says on a level of one to five, crews are operating on a level four snow response and will continue through the night. Maybe we should have. <laughs> Public transit also ground to a halt. These passengers getting out to push the bus. And on the SkyTrain, perhaps the most Canadian solution of all. Staff using hockey sticks to knock the ice off frozen car doors. The cancellations are widespread. Several domestic flights into and out of YVR. BC ferries scrapping all sailings on major routes. And it's not over yet. Another storm has rolled in, triggering a rare blizzard warning. More snow and strong winds will see the region pummeled again overnight. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Meanwhile, it's day three of a deep freeze in Alberta. There is an extreme cold warning in effect for much of the province tonight, with some spots seeing temperatures drop to minus 50 with the wind chill. This is what people in Edmonton woke up to this morning. A thick ice fog blanketed much of the city, making the morning commute pretty dangerous. And public transit had a real hard time of it too. Crews worked right through the night repairing a crack in a light rail line. Some folks still bold enough to bike to work, believe it or not, but health officials are warning people to cover up. Local hospitals have seen 11 cases of frostbite. To the story of Flight 752 now, and a major admission from Iran's top diplomat today that people were lied to for days about what caused the crash that killed everyone on board. So, of course, we now know the plane was shot down. Among the 176 passengers and crew killed, 57 were Canadian, 138 were traveling here. Many were heading to universities. In a moment, a look at how they were remembered today and the search for justice and compensation for the grieving. But we start with Iran, where, as Stephen D'Souza shows us, the emotion today is rage. 
At a funeral for one of the victims of Flight 752, the family's grief turned to anger at the sight of the Iranian flag on the casket, a requirement reportedly for the government to release the body. There are shouts of tear it off, and minutes later the flag is removed, yet another outward display of the raw emotion many Iranians feel toward the government. In recent days, that anger has led to protests in the streets and on social media. This stark image from the crash site has been transformed. The artist added a note written to a young girl, mocking the government's own words. It reads, put your shoes on. Looks like that was just a human error. Let's go, my dear. People make mistakes, unforgivable mistakes, but it happened in the time of a crisis. Iran's foreign minister acknowledged the protests and admitted the country was lied to about the cause of the crash, but says even he and the president were kept in the dark. I, as foreign minister and the president, we didn't know until Friday afternoon. It took three days for Iran's government to admit the plane was shot down. In a televised cabinet meeting, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani urged the military to be transparent about what happened and called for more coordination and monitoring of the investigation. The government today also released this image of Rouhani signing a book of condolence. Meanwhile, in the streets, there were no mass protests Wednesday, just a strong police presence at some of the recent flashpoints. And in a sign that Iran's religious leaders understand the pressure they're under, this Friday, the Supreme Leader himself will lead weekly prayers for the first time in eight years. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. So tonight, Canada's foreign affairs minister is in London where he will meet tomorrow with officials from other countries that lost citizens in that crash. Here at home, the government says it is focused on getting compensation for the families and getting justice. Today, two investigators will examine the wreckage. The TSB is also ready to deploy a second team of investigators to participate in the aircraft recorders, download and analysis once we know where that will take place. Garneau also said the government is speeding up visa requests and waiving fees, as well as providing mental health and legal resources. The primary concern is bringing the remains of the loved ones home, but identification will take some time. Ashley Burke has the latest on the victim's family search for justice. We can't believe it, to be honest. We can't believe it. No matter what Ramin does, he can't stop thinking about his brother-in-law. This Iman. In every corner here in the town, we have memories. I can feel him. His, his voice is in my ears. He lost both his brother-in-law and sister-in-law when Iran shot down the plane. We lost our heroes, to be honest. Heroes who helped his family start their new life in Canada. Canada they died on what should have been the happiest day of his life the day his daughter was born. I just trying to just pretend I'm a very good, but emotionally I'm very bad. Once I go out of the home, once I sit inside the car, I can remember everything. But finding justice could be difficult. Ramin worries those truly responsible won't be held accountable, but won't speak out or use his last name over fears of retaliation. I'm afraid of to be part of politic games and they arrest us in the future. Iran says it's arrested suspects. The country's president has called for a special court to pursue the case by all means, but some are skeptical. The Iranian judicial system is corrupt, uh, it is heavily politicized, and it is completely under the control of the supreme leader of Iran. Juno says the regime is in crisis control and could use low-level officers as scapegoats. It will want to make sure that some individuals are identified as guilty so as to relieve some pressure at that level, while at the same time avoiding blame as much as possible for the most senior ranks of the regimes. Canada wants justice, but first it wants more access to the investigation. We'll explain exactly what happened and then it will allow us to talk about the issue of justice uh, as well as compensations for the victims. Me personally, I want to see whose fault it was. For now, Ramin's trying to move past his grief. So something as simple as looking at old memories isn't so painful. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. On top of the enormous loss of life on Flight 752, loved ones are also grieving the extraordinary wealth of knowledge those passengers had that's now gone too. 
On that plane were dozens of scholars, including PhD candidates and professors who worked and studied at Canadian universities and colleges. Today, at 1 Eastern time, their colleagues across the country fell silent to honour them. Some stood, some sat, but everyone was silent, remembering together. May time heal your sorrow. At universities across Canada today, this same tribute to fellow students, professors and researchers who died on that plane. And there were so many of them. Of the 176 people on board, at least 50 were currently connected to universities and colleges across Canada, from Halifax to Victoria and more than a dozen institutions in between. Among the victims, experts in computer science, medicine and engineering, people with dreams and the drive to attain them. Like Professor Moajgan Daneshman, who in 2018 was awarded a University of Alberta Research Prize given to faculty who show outstanding promise. And Saba Sadat, volunteer, medical researcher and student, hoping to become a doctor. She would have been a rock star. That girl would have, I don't know what she would have done, and I wish we all could have seen. Farid Araste was studying molecular genetics. Amir Hussein Ghassami's focus was biomedical engineering. And Zainab Asadilari and her brother were both pursuing medicine. All of that promise lost. The communities that helped foster them now searching for ways to make sure they are not forgotten. We've got to think about some way in which to honour these students and to be sure that they're all remembered. At many of those vigils, former students were also mourned. At Carleton University, friends and family gathered for Mansour Khorjam. Among them, his son Ryan, who was 13. And Ryan decided that for his dad, he had to get up to speak. First to the crowd, then to our reporting team there. About lessons he learned from his father and how he's managing to cope. We'd like to play you some of his thoughts. So here is Ryan Porjam for the record. I stand up here a week after this horrible tragedy and I still can't believe it. I feel like I'm dreaming. I can't remember a single moment in my life where Mansoor, my dad, had any trace of negativity in his voice or actions. He was amazing. And we loved each other. If he was still alive, he would tell me to be strong. You know, you know, cry, get those feelings out, but be strong, stand in your place. Don't let life or problems or every single little thing get you down, or big things. Stay strong, you know, to the whole country, to the people who lost family, friends, dads, moms, children, stay strong. They'll appreciate it, I promise. Ryan, you are remarkable. We have been compiling the stories of the 138 people on board Flight 752 who were heading to Canada. You can read them on our website, cbcnews.ca slash flight 752. Well, for only the third time in U.S. history, articles of impeachment have been brought to the Senate. The trial of President Donald Trump will begin next week. That, as startling new evidence comes to light. Katie Simpson has that story. A smile, a signature, and history is made. With this, the House Speaker took the final formal steps in handing over the articles of impeachment to the Senate. And in a nod to the gravity of the moment, she gave out the many pens she used as mementos. Make it be very clear that this president will be held accountable, that no one is above the law. The Democrats picked to lead the case against the president escorted the articles across Capitol Hill, getting a preview of the opposition they will soon face. This is a difficult time for our country, but this is precisely the kind of time for which the framers created the Senate. Arguments begin Tuesday, though how the Senate trial will unfold remains unclear. The majority leader won't say whether he'll allow additional witnesses to testify. Democrats want to hear from John Bolton, Trump's former national security advisor, 
and they want new evidence considered in light of fresh emails and text messages shared with lawmakers. These documents are important. The document dump includes a May 2019 letter from Rudy Giuliani to the president of Ukraine that requests a meeting in my capacity as personal counsel to President Trump with his knowledge and consent. And there are text messages sent to Lev Parnas, an associate of Giuliani, suggesting the former U.S. ambassador in Kyiv was under surveillance or even the target of a threat. Tonight, Parnas is directly linking Trump to the pressure campaign against Ukraine. President Trump knew exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all of my movements. Uh, he, I wouldn't do anything without the consent of Rudy Giuliani or the president. The president said once again today that impeachment is a hoax, and he appears opposed to accepting new witnesses or evidence, tweeting that work should have already been done. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Now, the U.S. president is claiming one political win today, signing the first phase of a trade deal with China. And it's all a very, very beautiful game of chess or game of poker or... I can't use the word checkers because it's far greater than any checker game that I've ever seen. But we're going to be starting phase two. As soon as this kicks in, we'll be starting phase two. Analysts say U.S. exports should get a boost as China loosens its markets. But aside from cooling 18 months of tension, immediate benefits will be small as most U.S. tariffs remain in place. Vladimir Putin is calling for sweeping constitutional change in Russia. His presidential term ends in 2024, and he cannot run again. So his critics are calling this latest move a blatant bid to design a new role for himself and keep a grip on power. Chris Brown looks at how it's playing out. On a day full of political puzzles in Moscow, this was one of the strangest. Vladimir Putin with his by then ex-Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev looking at the ground, then the chandelier, in what appeared to be a contrived effort to look united. It all began with Putin speaking to lawmakers and proposing key constitutional changes to weaken the role of president, the very job he holds now. The Duma or parliament should have the power to appoint prime ministers and the cabinet, he said. Another power should also be devolved, including to an obscure body called the State Council. That seems a clear indication that Putin is laying the groundwork now for a potential new role, one protected against any moves by his successor to undermine him. Putin himself indeed will step down for real uh, in 2024. Somebody else will be president of Russia and that person will be by far not as powerful as Putin has been in his position of president. Just hours after Putin's speech, though, came another twist when Medvedev resigned as prime minister, taking the whole Russian cabinet with him. I believe it would be appropriate to resign, he said, to give the president the opportunity to make the changes he seeks, he said. That left pundits scratching their heads. Did Putin expect Medvedev to resign? Was Medvedev angry at the potential downgrading of the presidency? Impossible to say, but weirdly, in an over two-hour-long special on Putin's speech, Russian state TV avoided any mention of the former PM, adding to the curiosity. The final surprise of the day came when Putin announced Medvedev's replacement, Russia's little-known tax commissioner, Mikhail Mishustin. He has almost no public profile, but that may make him a good caretaker as Putin begins to carve out a new role for himself. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Now to a bid for power right here. Peter McKay confirmed weeks of speculation today, launching a campaign for the conservative leadership in a four-word tweet. Catherine Cullen has more on what and who McKay could be up against. <laughs> The two powers that once brought the Conservative Party together today may be about to shape the party's future. Peter McKay wants to do it as leader. I'm in, he tweeted. Stay tuned. There's no cakewalk for any candidate, and he's no exception to that. Strategist Dennis Matthews says McKay is helped by being well-known as former progressive Conservative leader and cabinet minister, but there's still a lot of work to do. He's got to find a way to make sure he's bridged both sides of the party, but as well as found a way to sort of broaden his appeal beyond maybe his base in Atlantic Canada and get it all the way across the country. Leadership aspirations aren't new for McKay. One thing I did learn from Jean Charest is you never say never. 
Uh, you never close doors. Quite a twist then that he may well run against Jean Charest, McKay's former mentor and a former premier of Quebec. Charest is organizing his own team right now. And this is where Stephen Harper comes in. Today, Harper left the party's powerful fundraising arm. It had recently been involved in a messy battle over Andrew Scheer's expenses. But McLean's reports Harper is leaving to free himself up to stop Charest, believing Charest represents the party's past. So when you look at this race and the seriousness of the candidates being mentioned and the, the seriousness of the, of the race overall, you know, I think you're going to see an extremely hard-fought leadership race. Another big name considering a jump, Ronna Ambrose. CBC News has learned that this week supporters gave her an assessment of her chances if she were to run. Sources say she's still considering what to do, but she'll have to make up her mind soon. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. We have more news next on The National, including the second hottest year on record. Why businesses might lead the change on climate policy. This is going to be a bloodbath if it goes to trial. New details about how a British tabloid plans to defend itself against Harry and Meghan's lawsuit. For one glorious evening, we were Walter and Wayne Gretzky in the backyard. And a dad who seized the moment to give his kids a truly Canadian experience. We're back in two. If we do not limit the increase of temperature to 1.5 degrees, we are no longer masters of our own destiny. The EU committed a trillion euros this week to battle the effects of climate change. And the timing is on point. Today, two U.S. agencies reported 2019 as the second hottest year on record, averaging 1.1 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Only 2016 was hotter. To quote one scientist, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, climate change will dominate the World Economic Forum next week. But can businesses stay in the black by going greener? As Jacqueline Hansen explains, the world's largest asset manager certainly thinks so. As Davos gets ready to host the who's who of business and politics next week, global leaders shared their greatest concerns. The world is in a state of emergency. The top five risks, according to a survey by the World Economic Forum, are for the first time environmental. The meeting will serve to make green investment mainstream and ultimately imperative. That's something climate activists have long demanded. And we're here to say that BlackRock is not Some targeted the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock, which controls $7 trillion for its investments in fossil fuels. Larry Fink, if you're watching this, think this through carefully. You can do the right thing, or you can keep doing the wrong thing. It appears CEO Larry Fink got the message. In his annual letter to shareholders, he pledged to divest from companies that generate more than 25% of their revenues from thermal coal production. What they really need to do is pull out of all oil, gas and coal. So this first step is welcome and we'll be watching to make sure that they follow through on it. But they need to go much, much further than that. In the investment industry, terms like responsible, sustainable and impact investing are all the rage. To me, this is... Uh, you know, one more step along the realignment of the in investment industry towards a more sustainable approach. And when pressed by Congress last year, some of the CEOs of America's largest banks seemed to agree. If we don't have a planet, we're not going to have a very good financial system. But as climate activist Greta Thunberg has stressed. The real danger is when politicians and CEOs are making it look like real action is happening when, in fact, almost nothing is being done apart from clever accounting and creative PR. What do we want? The same climate activists who have pushed for change will be watching for real progress. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Let's take a look at some other stories making headlines here in Canada tonight. My hope is today with the announcement is just a signal to parents that we're trying to be on their side and put a few bucks in their pockets. So the Ontario government is promising money to parents affected by ongoing teacher strikes. The province says it will give up to $60 per day of missed school to help pay for child care. That cost could add up to about $48 million a day. Three separate unions have planned rotating one-day strikes. 
Staying in Ontario, police say they have tracked down two drivers involved in this moment, sh showing a truck shoving a car sideways along the busy 401 highway. Luckily, no one was injured, but the driver of the small car is still pretty shaken up. Uh, he was terrified, uh, honking his horn, yelling at the top of his lungs, uh, trying to uh, get some assistance. Police say two people in the truck claim they had no idea anything was happening. The investigation continues. No charges have been laid yet. And next on The National, as Harry and Meghan try to find a life away from the spotlight, the British tabloids reveal their case to fight the couple's lawsuit. And we are proudly new Canadians. He fled to Canada from war in Syria, found a new life, founded a new company, Peace by Chocolate. Today, another new beginning. That's coming up. Welcome back. As news about her future swirls on both sides of the Atlantic, Meghan Markle learned today that she may have to face off in court against her father. As Rene Filipponi explains, it's all about her personal letter that he shared with a British tabloid. The lead up to this big moment was mired in family drama for Meghan after a public fallout with her father played out in the British press. The growing rift culminated with Thomas Markle handing a personal letter from his daughter to the Mail on Sunday, which published it. During a trip to Africa in October, it was announced Meghan would be taking the paper to court accusing the tabloid of a smear campaign against her. The paper has now filed its defense, saying there is a huge and legitimate public interest in the royal family and the activities, conduct and standards of behavior of its members. The press need the royal family, the royal family need the press. And I think that is some, and th that involves, sometimes things are tough, sometimes they're very smooth. Meghan's father will be a big part of the defense's evidence, including text messages between the pair. They're also going to argue that Thomas Markle is entitled to have his say. Dubbed Markle versus Markle, the two who haven't seen each other in years could end up face to face in court if the case goes to trial. In these circumstances, the only loser is Meghan, and she'd be better to cut her losses right now. This lawyer says the paper has no motivation to settle. This is going to be a bloodbath if it goes to trial. Uh, Meghan is going to be subjected to forensic cross-examination. She's going to be sliced and diced by one of the best cross-examiners in London. It will be up to the Sussexes to drop the case. If they don't, they could end up in the middle of an unprecedented media circus at a time when the couple are trying to carve out a new and more dialed-back lifestyle for their family in Canada. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. There are lots of questions still about what exactly Harry and Meghan's new life in Canada will look like. So on Friday, we're convening our special panel of royal and get this constitutional experts. If you have questions, send them our way at thenational at cbc.ca or send us a message on Instagram. More news next on The National. Examining the medical implant that's helping former humble Bronco Ryan Strashnitsky move. I'm just trying to get more, more core function. Uh, kind of help me in the sled. So why did he have to fly halfway around the world to get it? That's next. Good. For Ryan Strashnitsky, that simple kick was like climbing a mountain. Paralyzed in the horrific bus crash that shocked the country, the former humbled Bronco swore he would walk again. Tonight on The National, we check in on his difficult journey almost two years later. It's not just determination fueling Ryan Strashnitsky's ability to move his legs. Two months ago, he had an experimental device surgically implanted into his back. The Cadopia takes an in-depth look at what it is, how it works, and what it could mean for Canadians. Last November in Thailand, Ryan Strasnitsky became the latest of about a dozen Canadians to try an emerging treatment for paralysis. 
Canadians have watched Ryan's recovery from traumatic spine injury and transformation to sledge hockey player. Nobody trip. Yeah. Uh, way better than having to go through the Zamboni. Now he's training his paralyzed muscles to move again. For that, he's getting help from a stimulator implanted on his spine, boosting electrical impulses from his mid-torso down. I feel like I can move a little more. Uh, I'm just trying to get more, more core function. Uh, kind of help me in the sled, help with hip movement and end movement and stuff like that. So when I breathe in, the core activates, yeah. but when I breathe out, it stops. He had a Thai medical team in tow. Yeah, like it's twisting my body to the right. To the right or yeah. to the left. They're figuring out the right level of stimulation. Too much? Uh, we can try that. Pinpointing each muscle, each movement. Ryan's father, Tom, watches his development. But I think they're trying to increase the voltage to get the nerves going and his core going. It might be too low. So I think they're just upping it. Back at the Bangkok hospital, intensive physiotherapy continues to strengthen muscles activated by the stimulator. A mini squat, really. can you do like mini squat? No? Doesn't. No, I'm trying. Spinal or epidural stimulation uses tiny electrodes implanted over the spinal cord below the injury. A small generator delivers impulses, boosting signals from the brain in the hopes of re-establishing the damaged connections between the brain and spinal cord. I mean, I can feel the stimulation going throughout my body and um, there's, certain, there's a certain technique that my body has to get used to, to to move the muscles. Just how much motor function Ryan will regain is not clear. But his family still paid more than $100,000 for the procedure because of the promise they've seen in other paraplegics. They've done over 100 operations, all successes, all different levels of injury. And this is being used in Canada anyway, but for nerve pain. So. I don't know why they can't work together. In North America and most of Europe, the device was licensed primarily for pain management decades ago, not for improving motor function. In the spinal cord injury community, it's a very hot topic right now. Everybody is interested in it. Some people want to take part in it. Others think it's too early. Back in Canada, unlike Ryan, Steve Crochetier was implanted with a stimulator for free in the U.S. as part of a clinical trial. He was paralyzed 10 years ago in a motorcycle accident. Calgary researchers are following his progress. I will turn it on. With the touch of a button, he can move his legs again, something he hasn't done in a long time. And you're actively trying to... Pull my legs off, yeah. yeah. After nine years of not moving any of your muscles, any of your legs, you almost really forget how to do it. So the idea was to kind of retrain your brain to focus on those muscles that you haven't used in so long to do those movements. And the movement is, is from Steve's brain. Right. Th that's, where it's, that's where it's starting from. It's not right. from the phone starting the movement. Okay, it's, it's more like a conduit in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's reawakening some pathways to allow his brain to recontrol his legs. It's, it's kind of emotional right now just talking about it. I mean. It's a pretty powerful thing. While the new leg movement seems like a breakthrough, there are other big changes Steve's experiencing, building muscles to perform functions most of us take for granted, the invisible disabilities of being paralyzed. I feel like I have more energy, I feel better, I feel like my, you know, I, of course my body temperature control, all those things, having it on helps with that, right? What are the other complications that people may not realize that you live with as a result of a spinal cord injury? If you're sitting for too long in the same position and you do a small movement, your legs are going to want to kick out. Again, you can fall out of your wheelchair. I mean, you can hurt yourself quite a bit. Also, you lose uh, control of your bowels and bladders, a uh, major, major aspect. Blood pressure, uh, you know, going from laying down to sitting, you um, get very lightheaded, uh, you know, to the point where sometimes you could pass out. Steve, like Ryan, had to balance risk and reward in getting the stimulator. From bowel control to blood pressure and even lung capacity, it's transforming quality of life and independence. But there's still lots of fine details about this technology to figure out. We're measuring how much oxygen he's using during this exercise. Dr. Andrei Krasikov is a leading spinal cord researcher in Vancouver. 
investigating the progress of implanted patients and their invisible symptoms. I totally appreciate the excitement of my patients who underwent through this procedure, either through the clinical trials or they paid and went abroad. But one of the aspects, we medical community, we have to be ready. The next important aspect that we still need more data, can we, with the same device, activate specific target organs? How precisely this, it's a many, many questions, has to be investigated before we will come to Health Canada, FDA, for approval of this technology for new indications. Scientific investigation takes time, and Isaac Darrell says he didn't have time after his accident. The former oil patch worker went to Thailand in 2016 for surgery. He worried if he didn't, the complications of his injury would kill him. I think I would have had a stroke eventually. I was having very, like all the symptoms of nausea, blurry vision, sweating profusely, like almost heart attack signs like every two days when I'd go to the washroom. So. It was horrible. Okay. Alarmingly high rates of heart disease and stroke are common after spinal cord injuries. Now for Isaac, the simple act of going to the bathroom is almost simple again. I don't even have to use my stimulator. I've activated enough muscle in my core to just be able to go. Do we have a good sense of the risks involved with having these long-term inside patients? We have very clear track records of uh, side effects from implantation of pain stimulators. Typical any surgery is a possibility for infections, but actually incidence of infection is quite low when it's done in appropriate hospital settings. Right now we're doing a very well-organized, approved clinical trials to document what are the potential benefits and potential side effects. It's a small patient group though. So Correct. Yeah. It's a only on a small patient group so far. Possible risks include infection, shock, burns, and nerve damage. And even if the risk is slight, Dr. Krasikov says stimulators are still not a cure for paralysis. So if epidural stimulation is approved by Health Canada, is this something that you would get for yourself? Absolutely. At this spinal cord physio center in Newmarket, Ontario, Barry Monroe of the Canadian Spinal Cord Research Organization is optimistic approval for epidural stimulation is three to five years away. People are desperate. People are dying with spinal cord injury. We don't really realize that, that there are a lot of people who don't survive long-term spinal cord injury and they're suffering and there's not enough there for them. Barry has seen lots of promising research in his three decades in a wheelchair and lots of disappointment, so he urges caution. Hey, what happens for Ryan might not happen for another individual. We, we like to say a spinal cord is like a fingerprint. There's no two the same. This is a great step. We're just not there yet. Back in Calgary, Ryan's family is also optimistic his recovery will keep going. And the intensity is this right here. His mother, Michelle, is discovering what's possible. Right now, we're just going to try and focus on the right now, that he can have as much control over his body as possible. And being a 20-year-old guy, he wants to be as normal as possible and have, you know, those experiences as, as, a, as a young man. This is still a bit high. Ryan's physio continues with the stimulator. I think going in with that mentality, you'll be able to you know, push yourself and hopefully be the first one to actually walk on your own. Ryan knows this is not a cure, and while he's still adjusting to life in a wheelchair, he's also gaining some independence. Great. So Vic, I understand that people who are paraplegic have been getting these implants for some time with, with some pretty remarkable results in some cases. How far away are we with getting these devices approved in Canada? Well, it's interesting. Uh, makers of medical devices have often faced criticism for trying to rush products to market without enough clinical evidence or information about possible side effects or complications. But, you know, in this case, we contacted all three makers of, uh, or the three main makers of these devices, and they're not actually involved in the clinical trials. Uh, they're leaving it up to scientists and researchers who are doing this work independently. So the companies are hanging back a bit and not saying much about it. But, you know, once we see some favorable results in these 
clinical trials, peer reviewed, that kind of thing. Um, I think you can expect that they will apply to Health Canada and the FDA to have these devices used for this purpose. Okay, so walk us through it. Hypothetically, if it was approved tomorrow, how accessible would they be to Canadians? Well, in Canada, in theory, you could then pay a surgeon to do it or to implant this device if you could find one. But, you know, for our public health care system to fund this, they would, uh, it goes through this public agency which will evaluate whether it's effective enough that it's worth the cost. And then, and only then, could it be paid for by provinces? But even then, we saw with Ryan, there was a whole team supporting him. We just don't have that capacity and expertise in Canada right now. All right, Vic, thanks very much. You're welcome. And next on The National, a new chapter in a remarkable life. Syrian refugee, businessman, and now Canadian. His story, next. So big news here today, I just passed my Canadian citizenship test. <laughs> well, hey now, he, he didn't just pass, he got a perfect score. You may recognize Tarek Hadhad from this program. He was a Syrian refugee who founded the company Peace by Chocolate after settling in Nova Scotia. And last month, he couldn't wait to share the news that he was officially becoming a Canadian. Now, Tom Murphy has followed his story from the very beginning and was at Pier 21 in Halifax today as Hadhad took his oath of citizenship. Tarek Hadhad feels like he has finally come home. The unthinkable moment of adversity that my family has to overcome to come to this point where we are proudly new Canadians. It has been a long road from war-scarred Damascus to peaceful rural Nova Scotia. They came here as part of Canada's response to the Syrian refugee crisis of 2016. Along with his father, a chocolatier who lost everything in the war, the family started over in a tiny shed, making chocolates, winning hearts. Very good. <laughs> the community embraced the Hadhad family and they the community. The brand Peace by Chocolate was born and soon celebrated by the Prime Minister, no less, at the United Nations. Back home in Damascus, the Hadads had owned a successful business. Since then, they have built a new factory in Nova Scotia, hired more than 50 people with an emphasis on giving immigrants a job and brought more of their family to Canada. Sometimes people say immigrants arrive in Canada empty, but that is wrong. Immigrants, they have skills, they have talents, they have knowledge, they have experiences, they have life, they have dreams, they have hopes, and they want to share that with the, with the nation. We're starting to see how they are enriching our communities and how we are moving forward in a positive and a resilient way. Oh, yes, it has been a long journey. <laughs> but that makes this, the sweet taste of Canadian citizenship, so satisfying. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Okay, coming up next, seizing the moment to make a memory that will last a lifetime. You grow up living in the Lower Mainland and you don't get a lot of chances to skate outside. Taking advantage of BC's bad weather, <laughs> next. There they are, Walter and Wayne Gretzky, father and son, inspiring generations of Canadians to get out onto the ice and skate, maybe even make an ice rink. So typically that is not possible in Langley, British Columbia, so the unusual deep freeze gave one Jordan Bateman a bit of an idea. And that is our moment. We saw the polar vortex was coming and that there were gonna be sub-zero temperatures. My nine-year-old has skied outside maybe three times in his whole life. We were out there building this little frame and uh, putting the liner in and filling it with water and hoping it would work. You know, I grew up a hockey fan. You read about Wayne Gretzky and, you know, his dad would fill the rink in Brantford, Ontario, and that's where he learned his skills. So I had this picture in my head, like I was going to be like Walter Gretzky for just a day or two. Went on YouTube, looked around, uh, went on like, it's, it's crazy the number of people uh, who have put the videos up, but very helpful. I'm uh, now an amateur ice maker, I guess. The cutest thing is we're waiting to go on the ice and um, he's just about to step on and he throws his arms around me and the sweetest voice says, you know, thank you, dad. This is like the coolest thing ever. And then he hopped on and, uh, and had his great skate. Jack, 
Unfortunately, <laughs> it only lasted one evening because you know more than a foot of snow fell. The whole thing is kind of slushy and gone crazy. We're trying to save it, but uh, for one glorious evening, we were Walter and Wayne Gretzky in the backyard here in Langley, BC. <laughs> so two things. Uh, first, super cool. Second thing, anyone, particularly if you live in Langley, British Columbia, you're probably thinking, wait, I think I know that guy. So yes, that is the Jordan Bateman, former township councillor. Uh, I've also interviewed the guy a bunch of times in his sort of advocacy role. He's no stranger Not to the media. Us. Not about us, yeah. But uh, boy, he's also a hard worker to pull off something like that. Yeah, no kidding. That only lasted for one evening. And I bet you didn't know this. He does not know how to skate. That was, <laughs> no, that was no all kidding. for his son. No kidding. <laughs> wow. That is a national for Wednesday, January 15th. Good night. Good night.